All right, uh, let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the third UQM summer seminar. The speaker today is Marcello Del Monte from ICTP Italy. He will talk about uh, atomic lattice gauge theories, realizations, and non gaudic dynamics. The talk will be 45 minutes plus questions. Um, Marcello, you can take over whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. So, good morning, afternoon. Evening, everybody. So it's, I mean, as I was anticipated today, I will be looking at in the context of atomic lattice gauge theories. And in particular, what I will be telling about is a realization, so implementation of this kind of uh, lattice gauge theories and some many body physics related to out of equilibrium phenomena. So the people responsible for that are these guys here, and in particular, let me emphasize Federica and Giuliano, which are the guys that really did most of the work. Okay, so when one typically talk about gauge theories, AMO physics is really not is really not in the business. Uh, so one typically has in mind high energy physics, particle physics, where the standard model is made up of gauge theories like QED or QCD and so on and so forth. Or what else can come to mind is actually condensed matter physics, where gauge theories have a kind of very important role as effective field theories to describe several physical phenomena, in particular topological matters, field liquids, and to some extent also critical phenomena. So what I would like to show you today, sorry, uh, is that there are actually connections between AMO physics and these two fields, and the connections go as follows. I mean, why are we studying uh, gauge theories in AMO systems? I mean, from the particle physics viewpoint, what we are interested in is actually quantum simulation. So utilizing these controlled settings in trying to understand some complicated aspects of gauge theories that are impractical by means of conventional theoretical tools or even not accessible to experiments. Okay. From, the part, uh, from the condensed metaphysics viewpoint, I would like to tell you that a few applications of concepts from gauge theories uh, on non-equilibrium dynamics. And this is kind of orthogonal to some extent what, to what is the typical uh, use of gauge theories in condensed matter, that most of the time they're used to actually study low energy phenomena. So it's mostly at the ground state level. Here I'm talking, uh, taking a slightly different angle, actually quite different angle, and I will be mostly telling you about out of equilibrium dynamics. Uh, so this is the brief outline, and uh, I think I will not be for so at the beginning, I will give you some additional motivations on why we want to study these kind of things. And then I will show you some examples. First, you one, and if we manage in terms of time, also non abelian lattice gauge theories in Reed Bratton arrays. So it has specific uh, physical phenomena out of equilibrium, in particular, that's the wording that some of you might already know in the context of abelian theory, but also in terms of your mix and supersymmetric theories. Okay? And then the second topic is, in more, is that theory oriented and is a discussion on how to utilize certain features of gauge theories, in particular the presence of Coulomb law that characterizes them in low dimensional system at all energy scales, and how one can utilize this kind of different type of interaction to establish uh, on, strong, on thin grounds uh, stronger velocity breaking. So, that is gauge theories. I mean, the historical note, I mean, they were introduced first in the 70s. Uh, most, uh, most prominently by Ken Wilson. Uh, and the idea at the very beginning was very simple, was to have a for formulation that is non-perturbative to attack the theory of strong interactions. Okay? So both in terms of regularization, because the lattice, lattice provides a natural regularization of a quantum field theory, uh, and also in terms of computations, in particular Monte Carlo simulations. And this has been a field which is, uh, has been tremendously, tremendously successful. Okay. There are several physical phenomena that are really well enabled by this formalism and this simulation. Uh, Marcello, the your voice is a little on. broken. And here I'm just plotting uh, what is the low end. Uh, so is it better now? Should I come closer to the microphone? Uh, it's still a little broken. Okay, let me just see. So, how is it now? It looks like yeah, it's better. It's better now. Okay, okay good. So maybe connection was a bit weak for a second. Um, maybe if you turn off your video. Yeah, let me do that. Let me do that. Okay. So 
<clears throat> so here in this plot, I'll show you one example of, of this success, which is the low energy spectrum of quantum chromodynamics. And here I, and on this axis, you can find so energy. And on the lower axis, these are just particles. And you can find lines and points. And these lines are actually, uh, these lines and points are actually comparing QCD spectra computed by Monte Carlo simulation with the uh, real spectra measurement, uh, me measurement at, at um, particle colliders, in particular at the ion colliders. So you can see the success is amazing. Okay. Uh, and as I was mentioning before, I mean, this is not only in particle physics that these theories are used, but also in condensed matter. And there are many examples here from the state of space, the system and speed liquids, and so on and so forth. And to some extent, also in the, in the field of quantum computing and one. Uh, the first example that comes to mind, the Tori code, which is nothing but Wegener, uh, lattice gauge theory, but there are also other ones like core codes and so on and so forth. So uh, at the same time, it's useful, it's ubiquitous, but it's also a computational challenge. And let me just emphasize two aspects of, uh, of gauge theories, which are very complicated. Okay, one aspect is real time dynamics. And when we talk about real time dynamics, uh, we really mean trying to model what happens in experiments in heavy ion conditions. This is a picture taken from Alice at LHC, at CERN. And it is very hard to compute because this is a strongly coupled theory. It's very far from the equilibrium and having a precise computation of, of how the dynamics work. Is, uh, it's beyond control classical methods. The other example, very similar to what one encounters in the context of two-dimensional fermionic system in condensed matter, is a very severe or severe sign problems uh, when one goes to finite. Uh, particle density. And uh, this is again the, the QCD phase diagram. And in this phase diagram, it's important to have in mind what the axes are. I mean, this vertical axis is temperature, and the, the x axis is baryon chemical potential. You can think about it as a kind of doping. And the only line where you can actually have controlled simulations in terms of Monte Carlo is really this line. Okay? Because away from that line, uh, there is a very bad, sample, very severe sign problem. And you see there is a lot of physics. I mean, in particular for gluon plasma destruction of the phase transition between hadron phases and so on and so forth. All of these things are extremely interesting phenomena, but they're not accessible by Abilizio methods. Cool. So this looks very interesting from a perspective. It's very clear computational challenge. There is plenty of interesting physics in gauge theories. And differently from some of the condensed matter models, where sometimes one has to introduce modeling in order to uh, really mediate between materials and quantum simulators, here the situation is very different from the particle physics viewpoint. I mean, here the ultimate equations in particular quantum dynamics are very well known, okay? So there is no level of approximation. It is very well known what one has to quantum simulate or quantum compute for, okay? And this indeed has been a subject of a lot of, a lot of work. And here I've just listed some, of, some, some reviews. In particular, I suggest the first one by Ruben Yasvisa and also the more recent one by Preskill which I find quite interesting from the point of view of uh, explaining what the challenges from the, uh, and the motivation from the particle physics viewpoint. Okay. Uh, so, but where are the experiments so far? Okay, that's an important question. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, where are the experiments so far? Uh, experiments have a different, have a different level with respect to what we know, for instance, in the context of urban models or steam models. Uh, there have been some demonstrations of building blocks for U1 theories already actually in 2007, 2008, in both Emmanuel Bloch and Trey Porto's group. Uh, and then there has been also recent works at ETH and PQ, and also very interesting one at Heidelberg. Still, what they really mean is one gauge field. Then there has been a pioneering quantum computing experiment in the group of Rainer Blatt in his book. I will discuss it later on. And in this, in this experiment, what they really had were four matter sites plus three gauge fields. Uh, and you notice immediately that if you compare these uh, system sizes with the ones that you typically think of when you think, uh, when you are, when we, you have in mind cold atom experiments in the Humbar regime, these numbers looks, look really, I mean, very, very small. Okay, what is the reason for that? Okay. So this is really what we would like to discuss later on. I mean, why it is so hard to go to large scale, and then I will also tell you how to bypass some of these problems. Okay. 
do that. So what is the base kind of uh, uh, simulation of gauge theory is very challenging. Well, in order to explain it to you, I will very briefly that from a quantum engineering perspective. So I will emphasize only certain aspects, not all of them. Okay. When you talk about dynamical gauge field in general, let, let us take a very simple one dimensional example. Uh, your hyperspace is composed of two types of degrees of freedom. There will be metric side, metric sides at the vertices, and we will define psi operators living at these vertices. And then there will be a different type of degrees of freedom that reside on bonds. And these are these S. That will be our kind of gauge fields. Okay? And the idea is that the dynamics of the two degrees of freedom is uh, intrinsically interwined. So they, they really have a, an action one onto the other. And the typical example are this type of Hamiltonians that we've defined here. There's a very similar to minimal coupling. And this Hamiltonian tells us the following, that if we imagine that this land S are nothing but eigenvalues of the spin operators. Whenever we tunnel one further from one side to the other, we have to lower the spin or uh, increase the spin value depending on, on where we are tunneling to. Okay, so there is direct back reaction. Okay? This is really describing the coupling of quantum matter, this uh, fermions, to a quantum field okay, on the bonds. Back reaction is the key element I was just telling you. And in addition, the gauge fields here, differently from the classical gauge field that you have, for instance, in that after of set Hamilton and so on and forth. Here, they are really endowed by an inverse space. But there is an additional element, which I will uh, elaborate upon below, which is really the presence of local symmetries. That is the key point in terms of quantum engineering. Okay. Let me discuss this last point in a nutshell. Okay, there's very value in gauge parts in a nutshell. So the idea is that gauge invariance is nothing but uh, telling us that there are local conserved quantities in our theory. And let us again take the very simple term model that I defined before, and I define this operator G. Okay. Uh, and this G I define as follows. It's living on a, on a block made out of one single matter site. And then here we take NX, which is nothing but the density of fermions. And then we take the difference of the value of the of the speed operator on the left and on the right. Okay, so this is the speed on the left, and that's the speed on the right. Okay. So what happens to the expectation value of this object under the dynamics that I told you before? Let us have a look. At the beginning, we can imagine that we have this configuration. So the spin on the left is plus one and gives us a plus one. In the middle, we have no particles, so this gives us a zero, and on the left, we have a minus one. So the expectation value of this G2 is equal to two. And now we let our Hamiltonian act. And what happens is that the minus one on the left is untouched, and the right is untouched, but the plus one becomes a zero, and the zero becomes a plus one. Okay? So somehow the two things compensate each other. And what we have is that this G actually commutes with the Hamiltonian. This is a conserved quantity. This expectation value is a conserved quantity. And and I don't, I don't have to convince you, I think, that if you try to define a kind of a discrete gradient on a lattice of these spin operators, this is nothing but a discrete version of Gauss law, okay? Where the divergence of the active field minus the charge is a constant quantity. Now, what is the challenge from the quantum engineering side? This is the challenge, okay? So that we want to have dynamics, H, such that this commutes with a set of local generators. Okay. And this is very different. Oh, Marcello, we can't hear you clearly again. Think about called atoms or trapped ions or circuit QD experiments where you are maybe familiar with the concept of Hamiltonian engineering. Okay, let me see maybe uh, how long did this last? I think so. Okay, just, just maybe 10 seconds. Sec. Uh, okay, okay, maybe just go back and repeat. Let me just go back. Okay, so was it at the last part of this slide or? Uh, that you could not hear this me? Part, it, this part was good. Ah, okay, good. Then let me go ahead. So here I wanted to, I will start again from, uh, from this slide. So here I want to emphasize that when we typically think about cold atoms and trapped ion experiments, what we have in mind is a Hamiltonian engineering. So 
what does it mean is that we, we have a target Hamiltonian H that is made out of different terms and then we find out what the microscopic uh, mechanisms are to realize sing, see, uh, each of these terms individually, okay? And that's good if we have in mind global symmetries, but if we have in mind local symmetries, it's extremely complicated because then we have to make sure that each of these terms is independently and locally commuted with an operator, okay? It's essentially impossible unless we rely very heavily on fine tuning. So all this field of gauge theory is actually uh, based on a different concept. The concept is the one of symmetry engineering. So we really want to have a dynamics that is first and foremost gauge invariant, and then we, we can think about parameter tuning and so on and so forth. So how is this achieved? So there are a few uh, proposals to do that. I mean, first let me know, that, I mean, this is kind of trivial, but if we have local conserved quantities, this implies that we have an Hilbert space that we define physical, and this is the one made out of vectors where, which are annihilated by the generators of the C. Okay, this is clear. I mean, the first way to do this, uh, it's a mechanism that is very well known uh, in condensing matter theory in the, in the field of magnetism, is to impose some energy penalty. Okay, so what we really have in mind here is that we want to add to the Hamiltonian terms that punish in terms of energy scales states which are uh, which are not satisfying these constraints. So for instance, they can be terms such as the sum over all the sides of the generators, g alpha x squared, and so on and so forth. And then we add perturbations on the top of that. Okay. Uh, this technique is, is uh, very flexible for abelian theories. As a, however, a few cons from the uh, quantum engineering viewpoint. So all energy scales are perturbative, uh, which is kind of a making things tricky and it's also very hard to adapt uh, if we have in mind an abelian symmetry is also so discrete symmetries because then one has to rely on some sort of fine tuning of, of the constraint that one is realizing. So then there is, oh, sorry. then there is, uh, and uh, well, I mean, if you want to depict this in terms of physics and you imagine that you have a physical Hilbert space and unphysical one, what you have really is that your dynamics always stays in the physical Hilbert space, and if it explores the unphysical Hilbert space, it's only perturbatively, and then it comes back immediately to the physical part. Okay. So an alternative way of doing this is to actually not have an energetic penalty, but have a dissipative penalty, and this has some advantages because only requires uh, simple, it requires simpler type of couplings. However, the number of noise sources. Uh, that I have to be independent increase with system size, so it has some sort of scalability problems or, or issues. And the idea here, here is essentially that you always stay in, in the gauge invariant part of the inverse space, and in case you try to move away out of it, your dynamics is low and uh, considered. Then there is a third idea, which is based on microscopic symmetries, which has been used in a few papers in, in uh, I mean, already seven years ago. Uh, this is very robust. Uh, however, one has to find the case-by-case -case strategy, okay? So this is also very complicated. And the idea about this microscopic symmetry is essentially that you are turning to zero or matrix elements that couple the physical Hilbert space to the physical one, so you always move in that part of the Hilbert space. Now, in recent years, a completely different strategy has been put forward, uh, and is the following, is, uh, is the fact that in gauge theories, if we think about gauge field and matter, they are definitely strongly related, and one can think in some cases, especially on the lattice, uh, uh, one can think about integrating exactly or solving exactly this maybe better wording solving Gauss law locally. Okay. The advantage from the quantum engineering viewpoint is that this puts abelian and non-abelian theories on the same footing. The difficulty of exact integration of Gauss law does not really depend on the local symmetry, but actually depends only on, on its center. Okay, so for the type of groups that we have in mind, this is always an abelian constraint that we want to do. So that's kind of very good. Uh, and then gauge invariance is exact, because once we have integrated Gauss law exactly, I mean, we can have different type of errors that might, might be bad, but at least gauge invariance is exact. The cons is, however, is that this requires a lot of analytical input. So essentially it requires uh, one to solve the constraint analytically first, and then trying to understand if the model that one gets out it's, uh, it's, uh, it's implementable at the level of experiment. So the idea is that essentially, when we integrate our Gauss law, the unphysical part of the Hilbert space does not, does not exist anymore. Okay? That's why it's very stable. 
I will stop here now if there are maybe questions or I can go straight. I can't see people. Okay, let me, there are no questions. Okay, good, let me then move forward. So now I would like to tell you how we apply these techniques to concrete experimental setting. But before doing that, I have to introduce a few models. So the first model that, that we consider is a QED one plus one dimension. This goes under the name of Schwinger model. And it's a very simple gauge theory. It only requires to have a matter field, this size, there will be electrons and positrons. And they are coupled to an electromagnetic field, actually only to the electric field, because in one dimension, there is no really magnetic field. And it's very simple, as only two parameters, essentially the mass and the coupling or, max, or maximum kind of topological angle. Uh, and still it's interesting, somehow has a lot of effects that are in common to QCD, like the presence of confinement, dynamical symmetry breaking, and so on and so forth. Okay? And it's not only uh, connected to QCD, I mean, already from the pure computational viewpoint, its dynamics is very complicated and has been the subject of recent studies in the, in the particle physics community. And this is just one example taken from the group of Jürgen Berger's where the effect of, um, of a quantum quench on the top of a string state is studied. Okay, so this is definitely non-trivial dynamics, even if the model is kind of, kind of simple. So how do we put these kind of models on the lattice? So the first thing we have to do, we have to put fermions on the lattice and this is uh, quite simple in one dimension. And um, what we want to use is a single degree of freedom, which is a spinless fermion. And we decide to do the following, that on odd sides, we assign an electron. If our site is full, our spinless fermion is full. And instead we assign the vacuum, if there is nothing. And on even sides, we do the opposite. If there is a particle, we assign a vacuum. And instead, if there is nothing, if there is a hole, then we will have to excite. I mean, assign a positron. So the state that I've just drawn, it's equivalent to electron-positron pair. So that two states are the vacuum, and you can do the same trick and just write down the bare vacuum and so on and so forth. This type of fermions typically go under the name of Kogut-Saskin or staggered fermions. And because they're staggered, if you want to put a mass term, what you will have to do, you will have to put a minus one to the NX. So here there is obviously an NX term missing. Now, how to introduce the gauge fields? Let me make a very long story short. In principle, if one is using conventional Bissoni, like lattice gauge theories, one will have to use parallel transporters and define them on all the bonds. Instead, here we are using a very different formulation. Uh, it goes under the name of quantum link models. It was already pioneered in the, in the 80s by Orr, and then it was kind of uh, reformulated, I think, independently by Peter Orlan, Chandrasekharan, and Dize, and so on and so forth. And it's applicable to both abelian and non-abelian theories. And as one feature that we like a lot is that the gauge fields, they only spa span finite dimensional inverse spaces. Okay? So this is really the, the key element that makes us using this kind of theories for quantum simulation. So the idea in the context of U1, it is very similar to models of spin ices in condensed matter, essentially one is replacing electric fields with spin operators. Okay. Actually, the, the 1980 paper by Orm, I think the last equation is exactly spin isolated by cubic lattices. So just to write down uh, the, the equation for QED in this kind of systems, I mean, one has three types of terms. The first one is a kind of matter field interaction is what we will have as a minimal coupling. This guy, yeah, sorry. Time is gone. Is this guy on the, on, the, on the red? Then the second term is instead a mass term, is the one that we've written before. And then we have to assign some sort of electric field term. And the electric field will be nothing but uh, as, uh, SZ, the SZ operator that we have drawn before. So the electric field term will, nothing but, will be nothing but the square of this as, as Z. Okay. And here the dynamics is again very simple. If one thinks about tunneling one fermion from one side to the other, in, as in the example that I showed you before, what happens is that the spin in the middle just flips. Okay, so this is how neck reaction works in this kind of quantum links. The spins don't have to necessarily be one half 
Okay, they can be whatever representation. In the following, I will mostly use the one-off. Now, how do this kind of uh, integration of Gauss law technique work in, in, uh, in these models? In one dimension, one can pursue two routes. I, I mean, the first one is to integrate actually the gauge field themselves. Since they don't have independent dynamics, this is possible. It's only applicable to 1D, so we have to be aware of this limitation. Uh, and it yields long range couplings. But uh, I mean, it's something that is interesting. And this is actually, I mean, this is how we typically depict that. I mean, initially, we have a theory with fermions and gauge fields. And at the end, we have a theory only with a, a single type of degree of freedom, which is our fermions dressed with a Coulomb interaction. And in one dimension, increases as a function of distance linearly. Well, based on this metric, I mean, we, we formulated uh, a way of doing this in a prep time quantum computer. And then we went to to Rainer Blatt's group, in particular to Esteban. And this guy had a very small quantum computer, but it was working, it was working extremely well. It was based on calcium ions. And what these people did, they realized exactly the type of dynamics that we had. So the Schwinger model went into the gauge fits out. And they were simulating the following physical phenomena in QED. If you start with a bare vacuum, you can see in this kind of picture, the uh, Feynman diagram here. If you start from the bare vacuum as a function of the mass and as a function of time, you start having particle antiparticle creation. And what you can monitor as a function of time is the number of particles in the system. And here, if in this picture you have a dark, it implies that no particles have been created. And if you have light, instead you have a lot of particles. Okay, well, a lot, depending on how many sides you have. In this case, it was actually four sides. And you can see in this plot, this is a pure experiment comparison. And the picture you have to take is that. As a function of time, you have a critical time scale to, for mass creation, for particle creation. And this particle creation gets actually, gets actually suppressed when you increase the mass. Okay? And this is the theory, this is the experiment, and this was nicely captured. For those of you that are more in the context of dynamics of gauge theories, this is similar, but it's not exactly the Schwinger mechanism. Okay? And what they could do in this experiment, they could also look at other kind of quantities. I mean, one quantity is the Loschnikiko that is very widely used in quantum information, but actually I think it was introduced by Schwinger first in his, in his paper about the Schwinger model, just what he called it was uh, um, the vacuum persistent okay, for obvious reasons. And the other thing that they, can, they were able to look at is the logarithmic negativity. And since this experiment was noisy, this is the only quantity you can use to actually measure all the, let's say, let's say lower bound entanglement. And they were saying that for the different type of propagations that they had in the system, the different type of uh, behavior of the logarithmic negativity. So, uh, but so far, I mean, this is very beautiful experiment, but this is, since it's a quantum computer that we are using, uh, one is limited to small system size. So uh, what we have in mind now is to do something which is instead quantum simulation. So we want to go to large, size, large system sizes. And the idea is that you not to introduce, in, uh, not to integrate the gauge fields, but actually to do the opposite to integrate the matter fields. And integrating matter fields has different characteristics. Okay? First of all, you can do that in any dimension. Okay? There's really no limitation about introducing matter, about integrating matter. Most of the times, the theory remains local. Okay? The exception is obviously if you have fermions, because then the locality depends on the center of the gauge symmetry. For even centers, you still don't have problems. If you have odd centers, the situation it becomes more complicated uh, because you have to introduce additional fields. But most of the time, you have to think about the fact that you, uh, you start with something local, you end up with something local because the integration is local, okay? It's local quantity. And what is also interesting is that most of the constraints, they are actually a BM because they depend on the center. So they bypass most of the main complication of all these systems that don't abelian, it's typically very hard to be done. Okay. So in order to show you uh, how we, we arrived at the proposal uh, with, uh, with bare atoms, uh, let me discuss the spin one up quantum link. Okay. So in this case, Gauss law, I mean, we, we can break it down extensively. This will be nothing but our row. And is that this will be nothing but our divergence of the, uh, of the electric field. And then there is an additional term here, which is this constant minus one to the x minus one over two. This is just due to staggered fermions, forget about it. This is not essential, okay? And the idea is that once you have, once you know how to write down Gauss law, you can write down what are the 
type of configurations that are, that are allowed on even and odd sides. And you realize that actually out of a in principle very large inverse space, so the dimension of the inverse space locally, it's in principle the dimension of the inverse space of the single site is in principle two to the three. Actually, when you project into the gauge invariant subspace, you are left with only three states. Okay. And these three, these three states are depicted here for the even and odd sides. Okay, on the even sides, remember, uh, when on the even sides there is one fermion, it is like no particles. So the gauge field on the left and on the right, they are the same. Sorry. Instead, when there is a hole, it's like having a positron, so we need to have a sink of electric field. So these are the only three states available. On the odd side, one does the opposite. If there is no fermion, the gauge fields on the left and on the right are the same. If there is one first fermion, there is a source of electric field, so we have to have divergence because here we have an electron. So the key point is that we have three, three um, states per site in an effective manner. Now, how is this related to to experiments in reverative chain. And uh, I will actually start not with a direct implementation, but with a simple physical consideration. So this is a picture that I'm showing you. It's a result of an experiment performed in Michel Hooking's group in 2017. And what they did in these experiments, they were having an array of reverators. And they, what they did, they quenched this array with a given Hamiltonian show you in a second and they were observing that if if one is starting from a nail state which is what they have here okay at given times they were actually having anti nail and then at another given time they were having a nail so the idea is that they were observing very very slow relaxation dynamics uh, in, a, in a simple quantum magnet. Okay. And this has actually uh, has attracted a lot of theoretical interest and has been discussed uh, why, uh, I mean, why, um, widely in several contexts, in particular in the context of weaker codicity breaking, this quantum scarcity that I was mentioning to you. And uh, then the question is how is this related to gauge theories at all? However, there is a simple intuition that one can gather to, to understand that this actually could be related. And it is very simple, uh, is that there is a phenomenon in gauge theory, which is plasma oscillations, okay? And when we think about plasma oscillations, they have several features in common uh, with this kind of anomalous digital revivals. The plasma oscillations are slow with respect to all the microscopic time scales in the system, and what they typically describe are oscillations of an electric field variable. okay? You can see depicted in this picture, this is just a simulation of QED, Take it from this paper, from the other paper. And what you show is that you have just very long lived oscillation of a global quantity. Okay? So maybe there is a relation. Okay? And now let us see how this relation is developed. Okay, first, we have to write down some, some Hamiltonians. And this is the Hamiltonian describing this, uh, the, the looking experiment. Essentially, it was first studied in this paper, Fendley, Seguta, and Subir in 2004. It's an Hamiltonian of uh, spin one half. Uh, particles on a lattice. The particles are immobile, so this is like a kind of easy model. And there is a transverse field term, the sigma x. And there is a term which in this language is proportional to the detuning, so you can imagine this, is, you can replace this n with a sigma z. And then there are additional long range interactions whose specific functional form is not directly relevant for, for what we will be discussing. There is, however, one additional feature is that on nearest neighbors, there is a constraint. So on nearest neighbor, you can only have uh, either two sides which are in a spin down. So in this language, they have ni equal to zero, or one of them which, has, which is zero and the other one is one, okay? So the constraint is that the product of the nj on neighboring side is just zero, okay? This is, physically, this is due to a phenomenon which is really blockade. Notice that this is different from a storm sigma z sigma z interaction. And so this is really like two up are prohibited, but two down are allowed. And so it's not uh, trivially related to any easing strong coupling regime. 
Now, the mapping between this model and gauge theory is, is embarrassingly simple and uh, is depicted in, in this cartoon. I mean, well, you can write down formulas, but I mean, it's not particularly relevant. And the idea is that when you try to map the Rydberg model to the gauge theories, you have to forget about this gauge, uh, the, this, uh, these particles, so forget about them, and just look at the gauge fields. And if you just look at the gauge field, you realize then on odd even bonds, for the gauge fields on the left, if you have a zero in the Rydberg, you just have an atom pointing in. And instead, if you have a one, you have an atom pointing left. And then you do a staggered mapping of this on the other bond. So when you have a zero, you have, you have something going in. And instead, when you have a red, you have something going out. And then what you have to do, you have to just check for consistency that this mapping is true on even odd bonds. Because I mean, remember the Hilbert space dimension, of the quantum link is always three, but the Hilbert space dimension also of this Rydberg is always three because the only state that we are not allowing is two up on the same side. Okay, and that's a several look. I mean, here we have a red and the red indeed is pointing right. So that is correct. We can take the yellow here and the yellow and blue pointing out. This is correct. We can do the same with the green. Here we have a green, we did this, so this is fine. And at the very end, we do the same mapping for these guys, and this is also fine. Okay, so the mapping is one to one. We are not missing any state, it's really just kind of rewriting the same theory. Okay, and this mapping does not, does not only work at the level of few sites, you can actually also, also start thinking about many body states. And for instance, you realize that the nail state is nothing but what people call string state. And the anti-nail state or the other nail state would be the, an, an anti-string. Just a string in the opposite direction. And the vacuum of the Rydberg, so no Rydberg excitation, all the spins down, is actually corresponding to a very weird state where all the fermionic sites are excited. So you have a lot of particle and particle space pairs. So now with this correspondence in mind, I mean, what we, we can do, we can map also the Hamiltonians and we realize that uh, the formulation that I showed you before is mapped one-to-one -one into this uh, Feiglitz and Gupta Sachs model. And in particular, the kinetic term in the gauge theory is mapped into sigma x. The mass term is mapped to, to the uh, external field that was written there. There is no electric field term, uh, strictly speaking, because the electric field uh, is actually just a spin one off. But what happens is that you can introduce a theta angle, topological angle, uh, that shifts the electric field. And this theta angle in the experiments turn out that this is exactly pi, which is a kind of magic because it's the only point in the, in the, in the Schwinger model where you really don't have long range Coulomb interactions. Okay? Uh, so we were very happy in the sense that uh, this for us was a demonstration that experiments have already realized gauge theories at uh, very large uh, length scales, okay? Actually at the border of what can be simulated classically, okay? And then the question came, I mean, can we learn something more out of this mapping in terms of this exotic uh, slow dynamics, okay? And for doing so, what we did, we said, okay, look, the Schwinger model, what, what we can do, we can bosonize it, okay? Actually, Schwinger did it himself. Uh, and we can write down an effective field theory, which is very similar to a sine gorham model, that some of you may be familiar with. And this is actually what Sidney Coleman pioneered. Uh, and the idea is that this, this um, Sangorum model, if you put the mass of the field theory exactly to zero, becomes integrable. It's just like a bosonic theory. Okay? This part is, uh, is just, a, just a boson. Okay? Uh, and the idea is that if you have a bosonic theory and I switch on and off the mass, you can imagine that the dynamics will be very similar to what I depict here below, that initially, I have a very large mass, I'm maybe in one of the minima of my effective potential, and if I quench, I'm just in, the, in a kind of harmonic oscillator and I will just go back and forth forever. Is, has this anything to do with the dynamics that was observed in the experiments? Okay, well, the reality is that, yes, I mean, in, what we found out is that the string state is one of the false vacua of the gauge theory, this we knew already. Uh, and what happens in the experiment is that the, this kind of false vacuum alternates with the other 
back and forth. But these are nothing but the two string states uh, that we have in the gauge theory, and they correspond to the two narrow states that I showed you before. So the dynamics that was observed in the Lindbergh experiment is, is nothing but the oscillation that one observes in, in the sugar model between string and anti-string. Okay? They are exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence. And let me notice that this is not a phenomenon which is limited to the, to the Schwinger model itself. It has also been observed recently in multi-X model in one dimension. So it's kind of probably more common in gauge theory than, uh, than one can think of. So this low dynamics is essentially still the version. Uh, since we now have a phenomenology in terms of a field theory understanding, we can actually think about how to extend this. I mean, the, t, the two key ingredients are some kind of underlying uh, integrable field theory. And let me emphasize that this is actually a low energy description. So we are linking low energy to very high energy phenomena. The initial state that one needs in order to have this exotic phenomena still have to have some kind of smooth description in terms of fields. And this you might find at the beginning very contradicting because these states, these null states, it's the most discontinuous thing you can think of. I mean, the, the, the density of particles is oscillating at the level of lattice space. So this is the last field theory object you can think of. But the, in reality is that is, the reality is that if you map it to the gauge theory, this is actually a very smooth state where you have no particles at all. So the charge is perfectly constant. And also the gauge field is perfectly constant, okay? So that's why it's a state that this time leaving at very high energy, it is not completely unthinkable to, to believe that this is actually, is dynamics is dictated still by the low energy field here, okay? Uh, and one can do a few tricks. I mean, one can either try to tune the dynamics or based on this phenomenology, try to find other models uh, that show scars uh, this is kind of low dynamics uh, based on quantum field theory. And maybe I want to skip this because we are running out of time. This is how to tune it and um, how to use, I mean, this kind of low dynamics from field theory. We, we worked out a few examples. I mean, one is we moved away from this quantum leak. We just tried the Wilsonian Schwinger model. And this is also this is low dynamics. That's kind of a simulation where we have your time and here we have the value of the electric field as a function of position. This also shows very, very slow dynamics and oscillations. Um, we tried young Mills theories, uh, in particular SC2 cross U1, and these young Mills, they have a continuous phase transition in one dimension, which is a conformal field theory central charge one half. And if one um, finds the proper parameter regime to define a strong coupling with respect to this critical line, one can also find isolated scattered states in these young Mills. And also what we did, we tried to move away from one dimension and the natural replacement for integrability in model 1D is actually supersymmetry. And we found out that in, in, lattice super, in certain simple lattice supersymmetry model, one can actually has, have exact scars okay, and corresponding these low dynamics, even though there are some subtle differences actually. Uh, I think I don't have time for this, for non abelian. Yeah, sorry for that. Ask me later if you're interested. Uh, maybe in the, hmm, well, one minute remaining. Uh, let me tell you very briefly, I mean, the other thing that we look at based on this experiment, as because of the runner block one, is that, okay, can we do something interesting now with these gauge theories that cannot typically be done in, in conventional particle physics settings? And the idea is that we started this order. And why so? Because there is currently a very uh, interesting debate on the, the existence and stability of ergodic to non-ergodic transition in disordered quantum systems in one dimension. Uh, and the idea is that there has been recently, that this, uh, this debate has been uh, suggested recently based on transport properties, in particular spectral form factors, which are diagnostics of quantum chaos. And it's a lively debate I don't want to enter into also because I'm not an expert on the spin chains. But the idea is that it's very hard in, in, in this model um, to understand where ergodicity breaks down because disordered interaction competes, so finance effects are very large. And it is that in each theory, instead, it's very simple, but disordered interaction do not compete, and maybe we can use them to understand this slow dynamics. Uh, and this is like, uh, these are some, I mean, the fact that Coulomb law's slow dynamics it was known it is not something that we invented. This is just a picture of, of stream breaking as a function of, of G squared, so the dynamics. At the beginning, it's very, it's relatively fast. Later on, it becomes very slow. Uh, and the idea is that we were able 
to, to understand how this, this actually cooperative effect of disorder and, and engage works. And we identified universality class of this kind of non ergodic behavior with entanglement instead of logarithmically with time, like what happens in speed chain, was actually increasing with a double log. So it's really extremely slow and observable did not relax at all. Okay, I, don't, I think I don't have time to discuss the fact that also from the point of view of spectral diagnostics, uh, we, we found that GHTs be very different from Eisenberg models. And in particular, it was actually relatively easy to uh, find a, a non ergodic regime uh, in, in these models. Okay, with that, I think I have to skip to conclusion. So uh, I hope I, I convinced you that there are interesting interfaces uh, in the kind of gauge theory panorama between high energy physics and AMO and AMO and condensed matter. One of them is mostly simulated, uh, stimulated by quantum simulation. The other, at least in my opinion, it's mostly stimulated by the fact that the gauge theories really behave differently out of equilibrium with respect to statistical mechanics models. So there are novel opportunities. And I think that there, there are plenty of open questions, especially on the quantum simulation side. I think a lot of work has to be done before one really connects Theories which are interesting from the particle physics viewpoint, one will have to go to Nabilia and so you on know, and so forth. And I think that this route towards these challenges is actually full of interesting many body problems. Okay, with that, let me thank my collaborators and thank you for your attention. Sorry for being a bit long this late. Yeah, thanks for the very interesting talk. Uh, I think we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so how about uh, like two dimensions? What do you think is a promising direction mm -hmm. experimentally in two dimensions? Uh, okay, I think two dimensions, we have to separate abelian from non-abelian. I think abelian, uh, these readback platforms uh, are not so bad. There are already two implementations. Uh, one old work that we had with Alex Glades and other people and a recent paper also by Misha and Peter uh, and I think that uh, this implementation has very good chances of working. The type of models that one has in mind there are U1 theories, so they, unfortunately they have only confined phases, but I think they are interesting. If I talk about non abelian I think that at the moment this situation is not very, it's, the situation is dark. So there are only few implementations that, that have been proposed and none of them has been demonstrated even at the level of single building block. So I think it's an open challenge. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, could you elaborate more on the lattice supersymmetry model? What is the supersymmetry there? Okay, the lattice supersymmetry is actually, is n equal to two supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very simple because in these models, so, let me see if I have a, okay, now well, I can use that one. So in, in, in this model, the Hamiltonian is written like uh, sum of Q and Q dagger. Uh, and there are a set of models of this type that have been used by Fendley and Scoutens in 2003. And the idea is that these models on bipartite lattices, they work as follows. You have fermions hopping around, but they have uh, constraints which work at the level of stars. Okay, and now you've read uh, in this specific Hilbert spaces, you can write this lattice supersymmetric Hamiltonians. And what is interesting is that supersymmetry is actually related to the Lorentz group. So the supersymmetry is exact at the lattice level. This typically does not happen. I mean, if you try to put a supersymmetric theorem on lattice, it's is, is hard because when you go to the lattice, you break Lorentz invariance. So. And instead, these models have a supersymmetric lattice. This is why they are interesting. I see. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, hi, Marcello. Could you go back to the previous slide, the general remarks? Oh, sure. Let me... That one? Yeah. So, oh, no, the next one. So you have this statement about entanglement in gauge theories. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Okay, no, no. Here, the, 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 what I think is, uh, I'm specifically interested in is the fact that it looks like entanglement in, in these gauge theories with disorder, it is uh, propagating 
in a, in a way which is different from conventional many body localized phases. Now, in 1D, unfortunately, the entanglement in gauge theory is very similar to entanglement in statistical mechanics models. So this kind of like a Cassini a prescription on how you have to actually consider the fact that the inverse space is not in tensor program in 2D, they don't really apply to 1D. Because in 1D, since you can integrate one of the degrees of freedom out inverse space, despite not being in tensor program form, uh, you can always kind of circumvent this problem. So I think this is a specific question for disordered gauge theories not on the definition of entanglement. Maybe that's what you, what you were asking, I'm not so sure. Yeah, yeah, okay, I see, thanks. Yes. Yeah, I have another question. Maybe you have already yes. mentioned it, but uh, uh, pre previously for the one plus one D Schwinger model, you, were, you mentioned that uh, zeta equals pi is a special value. Uh, so yes. can you realize other values of zeta or yes. do you need a, other formalism? Actually, they can do it. I, yes, they can do it. It's actually straightforward. They can fully tune the topological angle from zero to pi. So, yes, okay. it, it's particularly simple. It's just a, it's just a um, magnetic field which is site dependent. In principle, you can also put, I mean, uh, how can I say, in homogeneous values, so space dependent values of the theta angle, but then I don't know what they will mean in a quantum field theory. I mean, the, the theta angle is a boundary condition, so it has to be something which is constant. In that In your last part, you were mentioning the spectral form factor. Like, have yes. you been also looking in gauge theories at this quantity, using this quantity? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, sure, sure. No, no, this is exactly what we did. Uh, so, uh, let me see if I manage to go back to that. So, the idea is that the spectral form factor in gauge theory behaves very differently. Oh, I don't have the plot here. Behaves very differently from statistical mechanics models. So the problem in this, like in the exit spin chain in this NDL, is that one can see it from this plot, is that the spectrum form factor uh, in the uh, close to the uh, in the in the putative MBL phase, the spectrum form factor does not show any any finite window of times where this is GG like. Okay, and the reason is that the tauless time collapses onto the Eisenberg time. And the, the statement by Thomas Crozen and collaborators is that this is actually uh, a direct signature, signature that finite size effects are prominent. What I can engage here, this does never happen, never. One always has a regime that is GGE-like, but in the regime which is non-ergodic, the correspondent, the correspondent tauless time so the time upon which the spectrum form factor approaches the GG behavior scales exponentially with system size. So you can clearly state in gauge theories that they are not ergodic because they, they could be ergodic because they actually have a timeless time which is well-defined in some sense, but this does not scale polynomially with the system size. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, okay. If there are no more questions, like thank, let's thank Marcello again. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, well, and we will see you the same time next week. Bye. Bye.